Great. Yeah, I'm so glad that we have this um, time now to just have a conversation about your work, because as we were just commenting, um, it feels like I've known you for a while and definitely celebrated your work at, at, from a distance for quite some time. <laughs> Um, and so it's really nice to um, have this opportunity to speak. Yeah, likewise. I'm happy to chat and and reconnect on all this good, important work that we're all trying to influence. So I, I, I normally start off uh, in this series by just asking um, a very sort of like personal question with regard to what was it that put you on this path? Like... Um, as the Sufis say, what like how, how did you find out this was written on the back of your heart? Um, I mean, there are a couple of different answers to that and different layers. I mean, you know, I grew up in a Polish immigrant family in the U.S., and my family did things in a very different way than other families, and including gardening and composting and chopping off chickens' heads in our backyard. And so at a very, very early age, I had a very kind of vernacular relationship with food and with nature and animals. And um, then I grew up in Colorado as a, you know, in a Polish immigrant family. And we were doing a lot of hiking all the time, hiking, camping, fishing, mushroom hunting, although it's not really hunting, it's just picking. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we had a very... Uh, a, a relationship that had been imported, I think, from my mother's, you know, she grew up in the Tatra Mountains of Poland, they're part of the Gurale um, culture, the Highlander culture. And so when they came to the US and found Colorado, they really kind of imported that culture of being in the mountains a lot and, and interacting with nature a lot. Um, and so that was already sort of a foundational thing for me. Um, but then I I started to work in urban and regional planning because at one point I realized that the world really needs to be designed for people like my mother. It's a single mother who needs to have access to safe, reliable, uh, affordable transit and affordable housing and safety and security in the, in the environment um, and access to good food. So I went into urban and regional planning, um, not really understanding very much about everything that it entails, but that led me to come to South Sudan to work on post-war town planning and reconstruction in 2005. So I came to work on uh, town planning with US government funded project uh, and with the with the new government of South Sudan, and um, we were trying to solve the wrong problems. We had millions of people coming back, uh, you know, after the war, trying to resettle. And there are, if you know anything about South Sudan, it is there are two seasons. There's just very very wet, flood you know, impassable, I mean, really, really impassable, like the whole country is just mud, not all of it, but most of it. Sud means swamp, right? <laughs> um, so it's where the Nile River comes and spreads out and it's, it, you can't access by car, by plane. I've seen planes stuck in the mud. So six months of the year, it's just raining and muddy. And then the second half of the year, it's like for six months, there's so much water that it can kill you. And then for the next six months, there's so much lack of water that it can kill you. And I just thought this is a design problem. <laughs> yeah. um, so I started just to pay attention to different things and hydrology and flow of water and agriculture and food and how people traditionally were growing food. And it was counterintuitive for me that you know, kind of our humanitarian industry and machinery was trying to push a certain model that seemed to not really fit in with how people were traditionally growing food for thousands of years. Um, so I started to garden also. I had a, uh, well, for two years, I lived in a tent in a mango forest on the Nile River. So you're really in nature <laughs> at that moment because you're just subjected to incredible elements, um, snakes and rotting mangoes. I think that's where I really learned about compost because basically our camp was a compost pit. I, um, I know the smell of rotting mango as well because I, I lived on Roatan in, in the Bay Islands of Honduras and in, yeah. in season. Poof. Yeah, it's yeah like and people are shocked that I can't, I'm not a mango fan, but... Uh, 
I can't anywhere anymore. So, you know, it just, it was this growing thing about where my personal interests were, my professional track, just constantly looking around and seeing that there were so many problems that were not, they, they were being solved with band-aids or short-term interventions, which in the humanitarian world is very difficult because you're often only having short-term funding and being able to solve short-term problems like humanitarian aid, food aid, emergency shelters, things like that. <clears throat> so I started to kind of branch off a bit and uh, I moved to Nairobi and I had this giant balcony and a giant kitchen. And so <laughs> when you have a giant balcony and a giant kitchen, you become a, a home chef because I started growing a garden, a permaculture balcony garden. I had chickens on my balcony. I had earthworms in my living room. Uh, and I was doing all this experimenting because I was trying to test what can work in small spaces uh, that could be applied maybe to people who are living in displacement. Um, so I just started to go deeper and learn more about permaculture. And that became for me much more about the landscape. There's like different grades, you know, permaculture is a spectrum. There's like the garden and then there's like the watershed. And I was really attracted to the watershed level interventions because the communities that I was partnering with and supporting uh, are dealing with landscape level problems and massive land degradation, massive uh, destabilization of hydrology, massive biodiversity loss. And so um, I started to just go deeper and deeper in my own personal research. I mean, my background is urban and regional planning with a focus in economic development. So it's looking at livelihoods in, a, in the context of what you might talk about as the bioregion, right? So um, anyway, then uh, I took two mini retirements from, or call, I call, call them fertile voids, uh, where I stepped away from work and spent 18 months twice uh, going around the world, taking courses with Jeff Lawton in Australia, dam building, earthworks, uh, machine-based earth, earthworks, streamscape restoration, permaculture, with, uh, three times with Dr. Vandana Shiva in India on seed saving, on composting. And I just kept going deeper and deeper. And now, um, now I work with the United Nations World Food Program. I'm the global advisor for regenerative resilience. And my whole job is just to try to influence the way that we do things. I always say, we don't need to do different things because people say, oh, that's not our mandate. No, no, do our mandate, just do it better. We don't need to do different things, just let's do things differently. So um, after living in Africa for 20 years, working with farmers, pastoralists, NGOs, governments, universities, uh, women's shelters, you name it, families, um, I just have been trying to help people do citizen engineering in their own lives uh, to solve very basic problems without reliance on external inputs, focusing on circularity, on resource recovery, local on-site available materials, and really just trying to harvest and harness the goodness of the energy flows passing through, like water and wind and sun, and mitigate the harshness of those same elements, right? So is water a good thing or a bad thing? Well, both. Um, you just want to manage a measured distribution of how you're interacting with that. And same with sun, same with wind. So yeah, now I'm, I'm here and I'm continuing the work in a whole new capacity with the UN, uh, which has been a whole nother new adventure, but so far very, very positive. So is that a recent development? Because I had you still placed with the Danish Refugee Council and um, from following your your work on um, social media, I like you're on the whole face of this on a on a regular basis. You're not just sitting in an office trying to enable. Oh. It. Um, you, I've like you've you've done a lot of work as you as you already said in in the field but you're still doing it once constantly um and i'd love to hear a bit more about this process of how do you um support the emergence of community led initiatives that yeah. do this work yeah so i left the danish refugee council in december of 2021 um, after five years, and then I was consulting for about a year and a half, and then just over a year ago, I joined the UN World Food Program, 
Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, there are different ways to answer that, but currently right now, no, I don't just sit in an office. Number one, I work from home. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also go regularly to the field. So this year alone, uh, I mean, in December, I was in South Sudan for two weeks. Uh, then we had an ecosystem restoration boot camp in January in uh, Kenya, and then I was in Uganda for two weeks, and now I'm going to Iraq for about three weeks, and there we'll be looking at urban gray water systems, we'll be looking at oasis regeneration and dune stabilization, many different interesting projects on that side. Then I go to Chad and Niger to document some of the large scale um, work that we've been doing. In fact, I'll send you the viral video that we made uh, in case you haven't seen it, it has 13 million views. Um, And then, yeah, so the whole year is going to be traveling and supporting our teams, which are WFP staff that work with local uh, NGOs, community-based organizations, uh, governments, and universities. But just to give you an example, uh, one of the things that we do is we have a program called LARA, which is the Livelihood uh, Livelihood Assets for Resilience Academy, which is, you know, UN is very good at acronyms. So it's another acronym, but basically through that, um, it's a network of universities across Africa Mm -hmm. where uh, WFP and my team specifically, I mean, the team that I'm on, um, we hold these ecosystem restoration boot camps. Mm -hmm. And that is with communities that WFP is already working with that are food insecure, or maybe have acute malnutrition or something, we do a multi-step process. We bring together uh, professors, you know, university um, professionals, local governments, um, community members, WFP staff, and staff of partner agencies. And we have a two-week boot camp. The first section is like a theory in a classroom. Uh, where we talk about the whole process that we're going to do. So there's two main parts. There's what we call a CBPP, community-based participatory planning process, Mm -hmm. where we sit with the community for days and really just unpack with them. It's basically like doing a large baseline. And then we do a major community map. And it's fun because we often will divide the men and the women, and they'll each make a map of their own community. And it's interesting to see who has more granularity, more details. I won't highlight which of those uh, uh, groups it is, but um, but it's really interesting because they create, you know, we put to bring water bottles and leaves and sticks and stones and little props. And then that's what they use to draw basically a large model of their community. And we start to unpack what are the issues from a landscape, uh, natural resource perspective. Um, So we spend the first portion of the workshop doing that participatory planning process with the community. We go together, we divide into teams, and we go into the landscape and do something called a transect walk, Mm -hmm. where each team has a sheet of paper that we have to map six points. So we walk together, and where there's an area of acute degradation or opportunity, uh, we take the GPS coordinates, We have a whole series of questions. What is the soil type? What is the slope? What is the land management practice? What is the, you know, whatever. And um, so then we start to map out what potential interventions might be in the landscape. We come back together and then we spend the second half of the of the workshop actually doing the physical practical uh, work on land restoration. So we got music blaring, people dancing, we got wheel bubbles, rocks, uh, people carrying things, gabion cages. So we're repairing gullies. We're doing terracing, stone line buns. We're doing half moons. We're doing so many different types of, uh, you know, low tech earthworks and stoneworks with the community. And so does, how do you build the capacity in the sense or or capability um, in the sense that you have your team that knows all these techniques. Um, did you have to train that team, or is that the, the, uh, have you is there a team that got got assembled that has all these skills and has experience in then training the trainers, and then they train more people, or how how do, how does the the rolling out of when you like what what you just described? I, I see a lot of people working there. How do how do they know what they're doing? 
Well, um, different contexts are different. We have regional bureaus all over the world, one in Johannesburg, one in Nairobi, one in Dakar, one in Cairo, one in Panama, one in Bangkok. So uh, every one of those regional bureaus and the country offices that are under them have different skill sets and capabilities. But mm -hmm. for within our team, the two technical most people are me and my colleague, Jonathan, who's an Ethiopian agricultural engineer. Mm -hmm. So he and I are really the ones that lead the technical training. Um, but for example, um, in the Kenya boot camp, we also had some people from the university professors who uh, had some, um, you know, who had some capabilities. But basically, I mean, you know, Jonathan and I are leading the vision and, and divide people into teams. And then we kind of rotate through, make sure, you know, we explain what needs to be done. We come come back and keep checking in to make sure it's being done properly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll remember that I was doing a lot of trainings with Warren Brush and I'm still collaborating very closely with Warren Brush. Um, we're in very close touch and I've uh, he's now doing some trainings in Uganda and I've sent many people from WFP now to Uganda to be trained there um, just to kind of tag team and split up the work. Um, but yeah, what Warren and I would do is we would kind of have a plan of what we're going to do where, and then we would divide a, a large group. I mean, the biggest group was 200 people mm -hmm. when we did the sponge village of Otego. So we divided everybody into teams. We would spend time describing exactly what each team, each team needs to do. And then Warren and I, like a cartoon, would just run around like crazy, just back and forth and back and forth, uh, guiding. He was mostly with the excavators and the bulldozers. And uh, and then I would focus more on the people doing the, the, the hand-based work. Uh, but we were just rotating through. We'd come you know, touch base with each other, check in, da, da, da. And then, so uh, it's, a, it's a very, very intense, um, I call it, I don't call it a workshop. I call it a work hard shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, some, sometimes we did a, a workshop in Malawi and we had many of my WFP colleagues who were used to leading uh, practical trainings on landscape restoration. So it really depends on where we are and who's with us. So it's it, it's really the because it's good to have the distinction between a workshop and a work hard shop because um, <laughs> work, workshops can so often be structured in a way where you do a little practical exercise, but most of it is in theory and you're talking about what needs to be done. But, but what I'm understanding is every time you do one of these, you're already you're actually implementing a piece of work at the same time. Usually. Yeah. Usually. I mean, like, for example, when I go to Iraq, I will go around and uh, we're going to go to five different locations and I'll meet with the government, with the community, with farmers, and we'll talk. But that is really going to be an exercise in planning, developing concepts, um, and then we can plan to come back and do a training. In fact, uh, we just changed the scope of work because we were thinking about going to do a practical training for farmers in Iraq. So it, it completely depends. When I go to Tanzania in October, I'll be there between two and four weeks. Um, I'll do a little bit of theory like for our team so that there's some, we, everybody can be on the same page in terms of terminology, methods. Um, but then we really need to get out into the field and get our hands dirty and build that muscle memory. So in Tanzania, we'll be uh, working with the local government. Uh, they're trying to do climate smart public works, which for them, it means how do we make bridges and roads that are resilient to extreme events. Mm -hmm. I want to change that mindset. <laughs> the idea is not how do we make the infrastructure resilient. The inf the, for me, the question is, how can the infrastructure make the landscape resilient? So how do we get water off of the road immediately and deliver that water from floods to food? You know, get it off of the road, because these are dirt roads, right? Earthen roads, for the most part, in rural areas. We need to get that water off of the road as soon as possible, get it on contour into a cascading dam system or a spring recharge system or, or whatever the context may be. Uh, but then I'll be working with households, women, looking immediately around their house. Is there a shower? Where do you throw the uh, water from your washing? Because, you know, imagine people outside doing laundry, outside washing dishes, outside cooking. So every day, you know, I, I tell women here, there's a rainy season and there's a dry season. So you grow food during the rainy season, but when is the shower season or when is dishwash 
dishwashing season or car washing season. There's no season. That's a daily availability of gray water. So even that little bit of water needs to be put into production. So in a very tiny household, what we might do is, uh, number one, I have temperature guns. Early in the morning, we find out where's the shade, where's the sun exposed. In the afternoon, where's that baking hot sun hitting the house? Do we need to plant a tree there? Um, and then we look at all the resources around the house, the waste streams, potato peels, banana peels. Uh, usually there's a little outdoor shower and that where's that water going from the bathing? That can become a banana circle, which is just a fancy name for a hole in the ground full of dry grass that you can plant with bananas and papayas and perennials supporting annual leafy green vegetables and things like that. If we go now to the farm, mm -hmm. that's the farm. How is water nutrient flowing across the farm? Where is it escaping? We want to have parking lots of water and nutrient, not super highways. So is there a road near your farm or a gully or a footpath that's carrying water? How can we have farms with arms so that a farm can reach out to that passing water you know, and that's the difference between stormwater run on and stormwater run off. Run off is the water that's leaving your farm, but run on is what we can catch and bring on and to the farm uh, from up above. So, you know, then we may look at how we design the farm. How do we block from the west sun? Because uh, that's the, you know, the hottest sun of the day that really creates a lot of evaporation. So we looking at all these different design aspects on the farm. We do passive water harvesting structures integrated agroforestry, uh, things like that. Now, going to the higher level, if you're looking at the whole landscape or watershed, um, it's the same principles. I always ask people, when you get out of the shower, Daniel, do you start wash, Do you start drying first your feet or your head? And of course, people laugh and say, no, no, we start with always drying the head first. Why? They could say, because if you start drying the feet, then the water keeps coming. So same thing with a mountain. You know, uh, we have to start at the top. And I always say, you know, bald men are okay. Bald mountains are not okay. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we need to start at the top of the mountain or the top most uh, sphere of influence that we have on this land and start doing many, many small scale strategies, earthworks, stoneworks of many different types to, you know, stop, create these like security checkpoints for water all the way down. So, it's the, they're the same principles, you know, of gravity, stuff rolls downhill. So whether it's, a, and also resources, nutrient flow. So whether it's around the house, the farm or the mountain, how can we create a home in our productive space for th that flow of nutrient and water? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of another hero in the permaculture movement, um, Brock Dolman and his um, slow it, spread it, sink, sink it in the, in the watershed approach. Um, have you done any writing up of what you just so eloquently and, and clearly and succinctly um, summed up? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I did do a, I did actually do a um, resilience kind of guide for the Danish Refugee Council, which I can share with you. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, that's something that I need to focus on is developing some guidance pieces specifically for our team's uh, you know, what around what I call the sponge homestead, the sponge farm, the sponge watershed, um, and this whole concept of sponge, you know, in terms of organic soil, organic carbon, and the, the moisture security. Not only we talk everybody about water security, nobody talks about moisture security. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the soil is the largest and, and cheapest water storage tank that we have. Um, so there, I definitely need to, uh, develop some guidance documents. But for me, it's, you know, most of the stuff I have is online mm -hmm. videos and things that I that I document, that I do practically, that I can just quickly explain what we've done, try to break it down for people who may be watching so they can start to feel confident to look at their own site in, in a similar way and maybe, you know, apply some of those uh, methods. And you did do a doc, uh, like a document, little video and a document about the sponge village process, didn't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. And that, that's available online as well. Is it, yeah. Is it through the Danish Refugee Council where you find it? Uh, or, or you just no, actually, um, 
you, if you just if you just Google the Sponge Village of Otego, we mm -hmm. did a primer document, and that primer document is it just it, it's a very you know using a lot of visual communications and graphics. Uh, it just sort of takes you on the journey of how we engage the community and looking at the whole entire village, the issues that they had, the strategy that we had for doing many different integrated structures, different dams and things, uh, wa road water harvesting into the village. And then Warren and I did a long uh, webinar explaining step by step by step how we did the whole the whole project. And all of that is amazing. And that's the kind of ecological design aspect of it but I know enough about these pro projects and trying to put them into action that the multi-stakeholder process and social engagement and community management process that needs to be behind that in order to do that effectively is is an art form in and of itself and in, in yet another skill set that like the the people who know how to do all these techniques to slow the water in the landscape, but then there's the pe people who know how to um, mediate complex um, partnerships. Um, how do you build that support? Champion hunting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you you really have to hunt down the champions. If it's a government department, who who within that department is the person who you know, knows the most or talks the most or cares or advocates most for ecological interventions. If you go into a community, you know, you can go into any village and ask the people, which man here is a gender champion who really advocates for women's rights? Everybody knows who that guy is. If you ask the community who in this village is the person who really loves trees and takes care of trees, they'll say she lives over there, you know? So you really have to figure out who is it that's viewed as a leader, as a mentor, as a trusted person within that community, and then kind of support whatever movement they have already started or to try to help build a movement around them. So for example, I mean, and we've had so many failures, right? I mean, like even in the sponge village of Otego, there were, there were issues. Um, and, but now the community is very happy because they went from being a very, you know, desperate community with huge herds of cows and no water that they were starting to enter into conflict with a neighboring community because there was only one little water point uh, that all the animals had to share and people. Um, but now they have permanent self-filling Water, three major dams in their community and the entire upper dam which is called the warren dam <laughs> nice. um, uh, is the one for the livestock the biggest dam is called the natalie dam and that's uh, for all the domestic use it's closer to the homes but these are like giant lakes that because of the earthworks that we designed every time it rains they're constantly filling up and if it gets too full it spills to the next system to the next to the next so that community is very happy, but they weren't in the beginning because there were some issues uh, in terms of engagement and communication about basic things like the payment for the work that we were doing, you know, because they were doing, they were uh, getting paid daily for, for labor. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I'll tell you in, in Samburu in Kenya, in January, February, we, um, we did this ecosystem restoration boot camp. But beforehand, we went, we met with the county government. They helped us to prioritize from their perspective the areas of highest degradation. So then from there, we went to go see various sites and different landscapes. But there was one that we came upon, and there was this woman who's the ward administrator. So she's the head of the smallest unit of government. Uh, her name is Selena, and she was such a champion. She was so excited that we approached her. She said, please, please, please do your project here and she said my village is actually called jerusalem and if you look at the outside my window that massively degraded land that looks like starting to look like the badlands of south dakota with so many gullies um she said that it's called jerusalem it's where i grew up and i would love if we can do something there so we went to go and see that community unbelievable degradation but i could see that somebody was trying to do some small scale little digging little trenches or half moons, very futile efforts, but somebody there was trying. And I always say it's easier to jump onto a moving bus rather than to pull a bus uphill. 
So I was asking, okay, clearly somebody's trying to do something here. Who, who is this? And they brought this woman named Priscilla and she started to explain, you know, that our whole village is melting, is eroding. We have so much erosion with every rain. And so I told my sons, let's try to dig a bit and see if what we can do. So between Selena and Priscilla, we just knew this was the right place because already you had people who had vision, they were committed. So we went there, we did the boot camp. And um, after the, we left the boot camp, I mean, we have a WhatsApp group uh, and we were getting bombarded with pictures. I mean, Priscilla and Selena told the community every Monday, Wednesday, Friday for four hours a day, we are coming out and we're gonna continue the work that we were trained on. And they have just continued. So we did landscape level restoration work, which they've continued with the community, but around Priscilla's household, and I did just make a YouTube video on this, we did a whole sponge homestead design. And 90% of the people that were in the training have now tried to emulate what we did around her homestead. I call it the sponge <laughs> homestead. So they're all emulating those um, methods to do very, you know, small scale biointensive food production immediately around the house using water harvesting, shade, microclimate, integration of trees. So that is a success story. And in many of other uh, WFP's other projects. Um, but first of all, you don't want to go somewhere where you're not wanted, uh, you know, or you're not invited um, and where people can't really figure out what your value you're bringing. Um, so it's, for me, I like to be able to quickly show something practical that people can take up. Mm -hmm. And if you have music, if you have fun, if you laugh, if you have a good time, if you're lighthearted, explain things in really simple ways using examples of th things that people can really understand that are like mental Velcro, um, that they can stick their understanding onto, then that makes it more effective. Mm. Wow. The, the one big question I've asked myself not just once but many times when I see how like I see the pictures of your work and I see how in every community that that I see in the middle of it's clear that you have real quality relationships with the people on the ground um, that you've done work with and you just mentioned WhatsApp groups but then you're in so many different countries in so many different contexts helping people help themselves basically um how do you sustain yourself how do you how do you um what what i mean on the one hand yes there is a source that comes with being in service to life and in service to others but it's still hard work and you can kind of burn out on it how how, how do you make sure that you also take <laughs> yourself um, well, the first point, just on kind of connecting with people, I just operate from the understanding that we are all soil organisms. <laughs> you know, we're all, we're macro organisms, uh, but we're all just a bunch of soil organisms trying to figure out how to stay alive. Um, uh, but yeah, that's a good question. How do I sustain myself? I mean, I think humor, human connection, spending time with my friends, my cats, cooking, that's a whole nother passion of mine. Uh, I mean, anyone who knows me knows I'm a home chef and actually, you know, with everything happening with Gaza and I, there was my chef goddess kind of stepped out and kind of took me by the ear and dragged me to the kitchen and was like, cook right now, because I needed to sort of center myself and focus my energy and be very present in the moment with bubbling mm. stews and the sizzles of frying pans. So I think being able to kind of really focus that that energy and be very present in that moment is for me a healing thing. But yeah, it's not easy. But I mean, I would ask the same of somebody who's working on Wall Street and you know has to get on the metro every day, leaving the office at eight p.m. And I mean, that for me is a, is real hardship. So uh, you know, we all kind of have our own context and uh, adapt to our life, and we also design our lives, right? So. I mean, for me, my, I think I have the best of both worlds. I, I sit at a desk for a certain period of time for a week or two weeks and develop things, communicate with our teams around the world, inspire people, try to get people to think differently, give presentations, webinars, but then go to the field, 
do good, try to do good work, try to document it, um, tell the story of what we're doing and connect with people who are, you know, they have the same biological functions that I do. <laughs> and we're just all trying to figure out how to feed ourselves and stay sane. And so, yeah. Mm. And, is, yeah. There, is there any, like, because you've worked in so many different contexts and particularly like I'm right now, I'm thinking mainly um, having worked both a lot in Africa, but also in Southeast Asia. Um, how how fundamentally different and how somewhat possibly similar in some patterns are those two contexts? So is it is is everything because there's in the regenerative movement there's there's this tension. Um, I also see it when I talk to people in Common Land, um, of there are clearly patterns as you just demonstrated that are applicable to different places but then there's also something about not no with the pre, pre prescribed solutions in reading the landscape the landscapes walks you were just talking about to to really um co-develop with people in place out of place and so I'm, I'm just curious whether having experience practical experience in these complex processes in different countries um What's your experience? Is it is are there transferable patterns, and do we need to focus on learning between those experiences, or is that a bit of a waste of time, and we just need to put the effort into um, the regional specificity? I don't know. I mean, I think you know, you just gotta listen to people. I mean, <laughs> if you go to somebody's household or homestead or farm and hear the challenges that they're describing to you, then you, you you go into motion and you walk with them and you, we, and we discuss, what do we see here? What, what's your observation here? And, or where are your resources? Where do you throw your food waste? Where do the goats sleep? Where do you keep the chickens? Uh, is that uphill or is that downhill? Um, I mean, <laughs> I always say that I often feel that my job is just walking around and explaining gravity to adults. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, I think, I mean, I've been in probably over 65 countries, and I don't feel that people are that different, you know, um, especially farmers, because whether it's too much water flooding or drought, uh, or pastoralists, people are really all that is the common denominator is that people are really subject to what's happening to the natural world around them. But I do think that there is an importance of having a bioregional context, which is a which is a word that I've been using um, even within our within our department, um, because we have these climate change conversations and climate mitigation. And some people still are at the satellite level understanding about climate change. And it's only carbon, 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 and have no understanding of how the earth works and how the dismantling and the severance of these cycles and functions actually is, you know, so I've been trying to encourage our team to think and talk about bioregional economies, you know, Western Kenya and Eastern Uganda are, are very similar. Northern Kenya, e Southern Ethiopia, Western Somalia, that's the same place. You know, so what even though it's cross boundary, um, but there there is a biological culture there that people have with food, with livestock, with animals, with wildlife. Um, so, yeah, I don't really know how to answer. I go, I listen to people, I observe a lot and I really try to help them understand, you know, with the, the goggles of resilience um, design, you know, how to analyze for themselves the all the different factors that are impacting the reality. Mm -hmm. Sun, where's the direction of the sun, the wind, the flows of water, and how can we trap that energy all the time? The biggest issue I have is people, humans have really, I can tell people to mulch, mulch, mulch. The soil should not be exposed at all. You cannot, do not see, if your eyes can see the soil, the sun's eyes can see the soil and the sun's eyes are sucking the water out of the soil. I always say there's three thieves of water, the sun, wind, and the slope. So all of our design is about mitigating those three thieves. Yes. And uh, 
people get it. They'll, they'll dig, they'll make swales, all the stuff, and they'll send me a picture and there's zero mulch. And even if I mulched it, even if I paid for myself to bring bales of straw and, <laughs> and covered it and left it and said, this is how it almost always must be. And then they send me a picture and there's this default idea of having a clean farm, a clean garden, which means no grass, no leaves, only a you know monocrop. So I do talk, I try to actually use um, these ideas of paradise as a unifier. So if I'm in a Christian community, I or if I'm in a Muslim community, talking about the Garden of Eden or Jannah, mm -hmm. I ask them, what did the Garden of Eden look like? Was it a field of wheat that they harvest and then it's just brown for six months of the year? Good question. <laughs> People say, they laugh. They say, no, 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 no. I say, well, so what is it? how was you know they said it's evergreen it's always has it's evergreen throughout the year okay okay we know they have apples um apple trees uh so what else and i asked them to describe what is jana you know do people have to work all the time and dig the land and they they kind of laugh and they say no that that's not how they envision it like they know it's this kind of green diverse permanent abundant place that's three-dimensional that is cool and inviting and they don't we don't like how have we got to that vision why are we why have we departed so much so the whole goal in then is how do we convert our farms into jana into the garden of eden so three-dimensional systems uh, lots of biodiversity. The perennial stability is the life support system for annual crops. There's animals, you know, animal integration, animal nutrient. So trying to just use, uh, meet people where they are, just meet people where they are and how they see the world and try to leverage that. I, I have a question that is, is something that I... Uh... I'm trying to investigate more and 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 find out more about um with regard to Mallorca. Um, but your experience in different landscapes might actually have a rather than the kind of conventional scientific opinion, a kind of lived practice observed opinion about this, which is more and more like in the scientific literature, the whole theory of the hydrological pump and um how how important plants are in mm -hmm. um, restoring the hydrological cycle at, at the sort of micro and, and landscape scale, um, tends to begin to admit it, but the, 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 the science is really slow with it. As I mean, they were very slow on Gaia theory until they called it earth system science, um, took them 30 years. But um, what's your sense like, because here on Mallorca, I feel like we're, it's not a massive island in the middle of um, the Western Mediterranean. The, three other islands nearby that, that are forming part of the Balearic archipelago. And what I'm observing every summer is that with the increasing temperatures, there's increasing evaporation, there's increasing mist around the island. But by 11 o'clock, um, the island has heated up so much because it's denuded and not green enough that it creates a thermal updraft, which means that there's a wind coming in from the sea and just goes straight up, further drying out. Mm -hmm. And what this thermal updraft does is that the moisture that is is out at sea when it tries to get near the land gets pushed away and then rains off at the sea. Um, my theory, and and it's just, it feels like, duh, it's obvious that's how it works, <laughs> but I would like your opinion on that, is if we radically, if we like that over the next, 10, 15 years, we have a small window of opportunity to slow down the water, spread it, sink, sink it, to make the island as green as possible, that the island, the, the vegetation itself can create the cloud condensation particles and the moisture from the island so that moisture and moisture meets above the island and then the moisture from the surrounding area actually would fall onto the island is that is that halfway sound theory or am i missing something yeah no i mean there's three concepts that you're talking about one is that sort of ocean dynamic i mean you know the the land mass in relation to large bodies of water and all of those drifts and uptakes that you're talking about but 
the second thing is about the temperatures. And what really people don't understand is that uh, on a warming planet, our assignment is cooling. And cooling requires moisture because that creates evapotranspiration. So moist soils are cool soils. And that is how you reduce the temperatures. But cool soils are living soils because the soil, because we are soil organisms and the word human comes from the word humus, this soil is supposed to be the same temperature as a human being, not baking out naked in the hot sun. Um, so the more we, with water harvesting structures, land design and soil organic matter, uh, and perennial stability and deep roots, we will retain that moisture security, which will cool the land and the soil and create a biological uplift for more vegetation. Um, and then the third thing you talked about in terms of kind of cloud seeding is it's carbon and that soil organic matter that feeds the fungal networks that sporulate, which is mushroom ejaculation. <laughs> um, so they sporulate and those tiny little microscopic spores are what form the nucleus that the moisture in the air condenses around. Mm -hmm. So as humans go around and just shave the earth of trees and carbon that's supposed to feed the fungi, the fungi cannot sporulate and therefore there's nothing floating around in the air as particulate matter to nucleize the condensation of the rain so that it can that it can actually condense and liquefy and and come down. So uh yeah, I mean it's not a crazy theory. It's again, it's just it's just how our earth works that people are so far removed from. And you know, I think we can absolutely unbleep all of these issues, you know. Um looking at things systemically, even urban infrastructure. That's another whole other issue that people don't understand is the impervi impervious nature of urbanization. So like in South Sudan, which is the sump of the Nile River Basin is completely, it always floods. It's been flooding for millions of years. The word sud means swamp. It's <laughs> flooding is its scope of work. So, um, uh, but now suddenly it's flooding more and sooner and it's not re re uh, receding the water and it's staying flooded and people are screaming oh climate change okay climate change but <laughs> within that Nile River basin you have Nairobi Kenya with massive urbanization I mean you can see behind me this new building that is coming up the skyline is concrete buildings more roads cutting down all the trees and creating more and more impervious services. So, so we have Nairobi, you have Kampala, you have Juba in South Sudan, you have all these major cities and even towns that are becoming more and more impervious. So the stormwater runoff has increased and the water that is released into the basin, the Nile River watershed is more because it's not soaking higher up and it's just falling down to the bottom. So don't like, okay, climate change, fine. <laughs> Yeah. but also gravity right <laughs> stop okay. blaming climate change for everything so but another point that i wanted to mention just the opposite of what you're talking about for myotica i had a call with jeff lawton some time ago we were just chatting and he brought up this point that you know um and in fact one of the things i'm working on today is a presentation for our teams around the world because we are uh we have a partnership on solar irrigation. People are like, oh, it's clean energy, sustainable. No, uh, removing fossil waters from a previous geological era from the ground is not <laughs> sustainable and it's literally non-renewable. Um, so we're trying to provide guidance and help them understand you have primary water, secondary water, tertiary water. Primary is that which falls free and nitrogen rich and acidic out of the sky. Acidic means it chelates the minerals in the soil and makes them bioavailable to plants. Secondary is surface water retention, lakes, rivers. And then tertiary water is groundwater. And humans, we just go straight to the tertiary source, which should be the last resort. 
and suck it out. And as an industry in the humanitarian world, we're constantly digging boreholes and pumps. So right now, what we're doing that I'm working on today and this week is a guidance for all the regional bureaus, country offices that, you know, our goal is to put more water into the ground than we are taking out. Mm -hmm. And we do that by ecological recharge and all of that. But um, what I was going to say in the conversation with Jeff is we were talking about all this desert agriculture, Saudi Arabia, I mean, everybody doing all this huge, they're pumping groundwater, spraying it, and 90% of that water evaporates. And yeah. the problem is, is that when you take water in a place that it's not naturally part of the short water cycle, we're artificially delivering new water into the cloud system. And what goes up must come down. So if the whole of the Middle East, in the name of desert agriculture, is removing groundwater, delivering it up into the water cycle artificially that wasn't there before, and then it's swirling around in our climate, and it's got to come down somewhere. So people need to remember, we only have one unit of water on our planet. There's no water scarcity. It's just changing forms and locations all the time. Mm -hmm. And the more we're severing and assassinating those cycles, the more it's not where it's supposed to be in the form that we want it. Mm -hmm. So now you have floods in Nigeria and Somalia and drought where you don't have drought. And so our assignment is to design landscapes to invite the right amounts of water back to where they are supposed to be in the right form, right? <clears throat> but there's no water scarcity in Africa. We just have design scarcity and capture scarcity. Mm -hmm. you so know? In, in, that's interesting. Again, based on the practice of having done it in so many areas, like I had this theory that there are contexts in which particularly sort of in, in semi-arid, arid regions um, where when you have a degraded piece of land that has been plowed for a long time, is very compacted, um, in order to get that going again, um, to for the first three, four, five, six, maybe even eight years, help the trees along with some form of, even if ha it has to be like wherever possible, rainwater irrigation. But um, if, if you have to pump a bit in order to establish the trees, you get a system going that in and of itself, then like you plant the rain, you, it, that that further down the line pays back this initial invest investment of pumped groundwater. Is that a mistaken assumption or is there a little bit to that? Uh, I mean, okay. So what I'm talking about is those large scale commercial farms that are ma doing massive irrigation, right? Um, but, you know, look at Neil's project in Saudi, Neil Spackman, right? So the first thing they did is they designed the landscape to and I can't stand when people say, well, we don't have rain in Somalia, so why are we doing water harvesting structures? The less rain you get, the more you have to prepare the land to receive every single drop that you receive, right? In the case of Neil, with Neil Spackman, where they get very little rain, they first designed, designed the landscape to get ready to receive as, you know, when it, whenever it does come. <laughs> We're on standby, right? And uh, so they were irrigating, but that turned out to be quite futile. Actually, many of the trees that they planted died. Uh, you know, Neil Speckman in that project they did in Al Bayuda. Um, but there, year after year, the structures they were creating, you know, because what you're doing is you're creating throats in the landscape. So when water comes, like drinking, quenching, quenching, quenching. It, that landscape, that little bit of land that they did swallowed so much water, but it took, I think Neil said something like six years for the first ants to show up. Mm -hmm. And then like seven years for the termites. I mean, that is how lifeless, you know, the, the land was perceived to be. So, you know, little by little, by catching that water, whenever it did come, that deep, deep, deep soil life started to activate. And now when you, uh, you know, Neil, they've been, they've continued to do this photosynth uh, photosynthesis monitoring. Mm -hmm. That project is done and dusted over with. Nobody's 
investing anything in it, but it continues like what you're doing is you're setting the landscape in autopilot. You're catalyzing this upward spiral of life and fertility. Um, so their efforts to irrigate, I think were futile. I mean, maybe it worked in the very beginning, but almost all of the trees that they originally planted didn't survive. I think I, I'm pretty sure, uh, or very, very, very few. Um, this, this is landscape scale, no, like at a kind of smaller scale of a, of a sort of farm scale. It was a, hmm? No, I mean, it was a sizable, I can't remember exactly how many hectares, but it's in the the desert of Saudi Arabia. So for me, the the aridity is more of the question than the scale, because just what was possible. Um, but it was it was a, a good size. Mm. Um, definitely, you know, enough to learn scientifically. Um, so anyway, but to go back to Mallorca, I mean, you'd have to convince some very traditional communities to do things differently. And, you know, I, I lived in Spain and, uh, you know, people kind of, yeah, this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. It's like, okay, well, all your olives are dead. So, and mm -hmm. not flowering. So. <laughs> Mine are. Mine are. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, there was, there was something else. That, well, Gone. Not to say that all the communities of all the communities I've worked with, the Spanish are the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they're not, they're not the easiest either. That's for sure. And, and then, there is no such thing as a Spaniard, really. They're all very diverse and regionally. I, I don't have regional yeah. identities, which is also really nice and and something to yeah. celebrate. Uh, um, well, this has been really a masterclass. I've learned learned so much, and um, <laughs> I, I really encourage you to encourage your employers to liberate some of your time to write this write more of this down and and produce whatever format it takes more materials to to share your knowledge and experience with um with people keen to follow in your footsteps because like what well, i i feel like we need to have many more people with the level of commitment that you have um <laughs> Like really um, brought my hat to say chapeau. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No. Um, thanks. So no, much. I know. You know, Dr. Shiva and and Sat and Satish Ji, they always say whatever you do, you have to write, write, write. You know. And uh, I know. I, today I was talking about Schumacher, which I know is your, you know, alma mater. Yeah. And uh, I know you're right. I need to write and document more. It's just my brain sometimes works faster than my fingers. And so, but that that is what we have a plan to do is to develop more guidance documents, which would be publicly available for our teams, for other people, communities, um, and and also do more videos. I mean, think of if, if that's the stumbling block, have just when you're out there, record something on audio, get somebody to transcribe it or, or put it into one of those terrible machines that do it automatically. And, <laughs> and, and then you already have, have something to, to edit down or have, have somebody else edit down. And then you can just read through it and say, well, that's, you got that right. Or just edit a document rather than have to write it. But the, now by mentioning Satish Ji and Vandana Shiva, um, you reminded me of the last question I wanted to ask, because I know that, um, I mean, you alluded to it with your two, um, sabbaticals for the planet um the to, to, <laughs> um 18 months periods where you went into apprenticeship mode um who were you like let's celebrate the elders for for a little bit before we wrap up okay i mean definitely dr uh, vandana shiva vandana ji um and satish and narsana kapula and uh warren brush David Spicer, Jeff Lawton, Mora Gamble, um, Brad Lancaster. Mm -hmm. I wish there were more women in there. Romero? Uh, what's Ro that? Did you have anything to do with Ros Rosemary? No, I've not. We have not uh, interacted. I would say the Lush Cosmetics team also, you yeah. know, the, yeah. the people at Lush. Um, I think I already said David Spicer. He's amazing. Uh, oh, there's so many. 
um, there's those are only ones that I've known directly and studied with. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, oh, Siggy Coco, you know, because it's also the natural building components. So Siggy Coco is somebody who is a global name in natural building. Mm -hmm. um, also, the people in Bali that do the bamboo, like Bamboo School, the Green Village, uh, so that's Arif Rabik, um, Oren Hardy, Alora Hardy, that whole bamboo family that are really pushing the levels. Oh, and mm -hmm. Yorick Stomberg. Um, so all of the people that are really pushing the boundaries with the timbers of the future uh, and just natural building and moving away from concrete. I mean, concrete, humans consume more concrete than food by metric ton. It's water wow. and then concrete and then food. And in Crater so, in France, have you the, the Earth Building Institute in France? Uh, I think they're called Crater or Crater or something. Have you come across them? No. Mm. Oh, and also my friends like in Zanzibar, Franco, uh, Guse, and uh, Bernadette Kirsch, um, they're you know at Fumba Town that are mm. trying to do this permaculture town, and they have really influenced the whole island of Zanzibar, the international community, the local community on the work that they're doing. Um, oh, and a Kenyan farmer, James Cogway, mm -hmm. uh, who I've worked with very closely, who, you know, when I first met him, he was, he had a garbage collection operation and I needed some rubbish because I was conducting a compost training for women. And somebody said, oh, you can go to this guy and he has a whole garbage dump. And I went and he's wearing coveralls and he had a donkey cart and a donkey named Mr. Rhino and every day he would go around and collect rubbish from these communities and try to give that resource a second life. So when I saw what he was doing I said I don't have time right now but I want to come back to you and talk about uh, something called permaculture and he was just so you could just I was standing in the garbage dump and like the, the, the smell it was like needles in my frontal lobes you know it was so bad but the way he talked about it he was radiating you know and I could see that he had a vision and I didn't see the vision but I saw him having the vision and so that was so inspiring and so after that I uh, I sent him to a permaculture design course and then a permaculture TOT and then a master composting course and an earth water harvesting course and a dry land permaculture course and a seed saving course and a natural building course and he is a, the name of permaculture in East Africa. He's even the UN is trying to hire him to go to Somalia. He's a consultant to the government. If they're having an environmental meeting, they invite him. And, you know, he's now just really come into his own. And, you know, he's just an amazing champion and inspiration and training women, women, women all over East Africa. Yeah. Well, yeah, there are more. There are more, I'm sure. You, yeah. you're one of them. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, John D. Lu also. Absolutely. Uh, Rajendra yeah. Singh. Um, you know Rajendra G. Yeah, uh, uh, Andrew Millison, um, obviously. Um, well, he, came to, he came to mind when you were when you were saying, yeah, we need to do more to like in the kind of transfer of videos and this basic knowledge. He does such nice videos with that glass wall and his drawings, like doing a couple together um, that that could could help communities everywhere, my, like around that whole water retention scale from the household to the community to the watershed. Um, I, I was seeing you and him doing a video together. Well, I'll, I'm going to send you the video that we jerked it. Well, um, we worked on together. Hold on one that second. Animated explainer videos are the best way to capture okay. attention. Right. Years ago before the war. Okay. So uh, Andrew actually um, last year was heading to Senegal and he's like, do you by chance have you know, any projects you recommend that I check out while I'm in Senegal? And I said, yeah, ours. And uh, he made this video and it's all has almost 13 million views. Oh, wow. I didn't have any. Yeah. Cool. I'll, I'll watch it later. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. and that's why I'm actually heading to Chad and Niger uh, in August because I'm going to meet Andrew well, in Chad and Niger and we're going to make more videos. So, you'll enjoy that video a lot. Brilliant. <laughs> it's already happening. Fantastic. The, <laughs> the last thing I'm going to say before I hang up is, is um, my focus has been really very much on the 
Mallorca and the Balearic archipelago as the bioregions just simply because I've got a family now and I'm kind of trying to grow roots and, and make a difference where I live. Um, and I've been working a lot with an organization called Save the Med that is very much also really focused on the sea around Mallorca. Um, but because it, they have that name, we've constantly been saying, how does our local bioregion sit in the larger bioregion, sit in the larger bioregion? And, and just the other day, I was working on that and suddenly saw how the overall biome of the Mediterranean basin watershed connects on the one hand, the work I do with Tobias Luther, who's got um, an institute up in the upper Po Valley in the in the Alps, because the the Po Valley em empties into the Mediterranean, and it also connects all the way up the Nile Valley. Um, the work that friends of mine are doing in Kenya, and and so it's fascinating that even the work along the Nile River basin is actually somewhat linked to the wider Mediterranean health as well. Um, oh. Just. Okay. Yeah, and you know, the funny thing is, I know the entire Nile for 20 years I've been working in Uganda, in South Sudan, Sudan, in Ethiopia. There's not a section of the Nile except for Egypt that I have. Right. Oops. Got cut off. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, when I joined WFP, um, when I came home after two weeks in Rome, for the first time, they put me on Egypt air. And I had just been reading about the Queen of Sheba in Yemen, who made the biggest dam ever of humanity. Um, and then Cleopatra and their relationships with Rome and those trade routes. And so I, I was always already like all this history coming uh, coming up in my mind. And for the first time I flew and it was sunset. So you can imagine reaching over Egypt where you see the Nile braiding out and you know shimmering with the sunset. I cried. I, I had never seen the point where the Nile meets the Mediterranean. It was so powerful. And to think that, you know, you know, the ancient, ancient civilizations that were there. And if you see what it looks like now from the air, but yeah, yeah I mean, of course, that whole. I think the connection is going to break again, but well, let's connect again soon and um, must put you in touch with my friend Luea, who is working on a partnership between the different Nile bioregions in the larger whole Nile Delta, Delta, connecting all those nations. Um, you might already know about her. Um, I need to go now and you're, you're stuck. So <laughs> thank you so much for the time. And hopefully uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Um, follow up by email. All right. Bye. Thank you.